So welcome everyone to this uh, LCN uh, symposium on the opportunities presented by new ultra fast laser sources. So we've got, as is normal for these, we've got three talks, one from each institution. Uh, the one difference from what sometimes happens is we've got three separate presentations, two video and one live. So we'll take questions after each presentation rather than waiting till the end as we sometimes do. So our first speaker is Amel Zaire from King's. She's going to tell us about Atasecad XUV sources from lab to infrastructure. So over to you, Amel. Good afternoon. My name is Amel Zaire. I'm from King's College London. And I would like first to thank the organizer to invite me for this ultra-fast laser seminar of LCM. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, present you an overview about attosecond XUV sources from uh, laboratory-based attosecond sources to infrastructures-based uh, attosecond sources. So let me first frame the timescale we're talking about. We're talking about at a second time scale, eventually femtosecond time scales, and the dynamic involved in those time scales are mainly uh, molecular reaction, nuclear motion, which takes place in femtosecond time scale, and electronic motion, which takes place in at a second time scale. And what is really interesting is not only to observe those dynamic, but also to understand the correlation between the two. So what we want to do is to see and follow dynamics from at a second time scale to femtosecond time scale. So uh, the motivation for that, I will give you three examples, but there's more than that. Um, the first example is basically we can study damages in system and how they happen when they are photo-induced. Uh, we can also look at change of properties in system, eventually control them on at a second time scale. And we can also look at a more complex system like lattices or uh, solids and try to understand how we can produce, for example, efficiently ultra-fast current. And that would be basically with impact on optoelectronic, for example. So with those motivation in mind, so we need, of course, to uh, produce at a second pulse uh, source and optimize them. So how does it work? The first thing we need to understand, and you all know that, is that to get very short pulses, you need a really broad band of photon available. So for femtosecond, you would look into the visible or the infrared range, and you will try to produce about 30 nanometers of bandwidth. But for at a second, you need to produce a very, very big bandwidth that is much larger than that. And for that, the higher many generation process provides a unique opportunity to produce this very large bandwidth uh, uh, of, of photons. So with the higher many generation, which is a process that converts a laser frequency into its highest uh, harmonics, you will produce a broadband more into the VUV, the EUV, XUV, or even reaching um, X-rays. And this is coherent light that is emitted as a flash of light. Um, so for that, we take advantage of uh, the technology from femtosecond laser, strong uh, femtosecond lasers, and of course, of the well-known, for example, TISA femtosecond CPA, triple simplification technique. Uh, which was invented by Donna Strickland and uh, Gérard Mourou, who received the uh, Nobel Prize in 2018. And from this type of laser, we uh, study basically the interaction with matter and the production of high harmonic. And usually we have developed also lots of diagnostic spectrally, but also temporally to measure those flash of lights. And they are listed here. There's different groups that have developed that. And here you have an example of a rapid measurement I did where you have a train of at a second pulses with pulses of about 290 at a second. Now the conceptual idea of at a second sources lay behind the high harmonic generation process, which happened as follow for a very simple system, just an atom. So here on the top you have more like a classical view of the interaction and here you have more like a quasi-classical, quasi-quantum view of the process. So you have an atom with an electronic wave packet in its ground state. This is described by a Coulombic potential here. And when this system is under a strong laser field, what happens is that the interaction is non-perturbative. So the potential is going to bend every half cycle. So you are creating a barrier here every half cycle and the electronic wave packet can now tunnel through this barrier and then be freed in the continuum and uh, seeing only the laser field will be uh, accelerated by this laser field um, and acquiring a kinetic energy 
and also brought back to the core because the uh, vector potential of the laser changed uh, direction from this half cycle to this half cycle. And at recombination, it recombines radiatively and it produces high many generation uh, that you can see here and here is in the classical picture. What is really interesting is that uh, this type of trajectory is uh, not basically a singular. You can have many different types of trajectories. And at King's, we take advantage of those different trajectories to create an interferometer at the level of the system. And therefore, this interferometer allows us to follow dynamics of the system uh, on the at the second time scale. Now, uh, the new trend in, uh, in the community was not to use TISAF system, although this is still very valid, uh, but it's to go in two different directions. Uh, one direction would be to go for really powerful lasers to uh, produce high harmonic and crank the energy per pulse in the at second pulses. The other uh, strategy was to go to high repetition rate and, uh, and basically produce high harmonic and therefore uh, kind of capture a very rare event because you have a lot of pulses per millisecond, for example, and you can do a lot of statistical uh, study. So this is the strategy we decided to develop at King's, that we would go into the higher repetition rate. So therefore, we have developed our high harmonic uh, beamline and at a second beamline, not on TISAF laser system, but only terbium CPA uh, technology. And uh, all our lab is on basically terbium CPA technology and not in TISAF anymore. So this is an example of uh, the system that is on one optical uh, table and the at a second time, uh, the at a second beam line is also on one optical uh, uh, table. Uh, this system was first built at Imperial College and then was brought to King's in when the group was created. And uh, we did the first uh, a demonstration of high repetition rate at a second pulse and pulses with our colleague from uh, the Jena University, so the Jens Limpert group, where we produced uh, 50 kilohertz to megahertz non-neutral at a second pulses. At high repetition rate, therefore. So now that we have uh, this type of, infra, of, of laboratory, we also use the Laser Lab Europe Consortium, which is a consortium of different laboratory based uh, at a second sources, but they have different uh, systems. So it could be, for example, not Eterbium, but actually TISAF, as I said before, and with higher power. Uh, so in this consortium, we use basically the facility in Paris and in Bordeaux, but also in Heraklion here. And what we do usually is that we export one or two of our IDs, mainly on gas phase hyamanic and also, also on pump probe, uh, uh, pump probe scheme. Um, and here is the list of what we develop at King's uh, mainly. So we targeting solid dynamic. Uh, we also look into hot carrier dynamic in metamaterial together with Wayne Dixon and Anatoly Sayat. We look also on more sensor laser with George Booth. And we are starting looking into topological solids. Um, and we develop a lot of diagnostic at higher repetition rate, for example, and a lot of diagnostic also that can be used on those laser lab uh, consortium. Um, and a lot of new scheme for pump probe experiment, whether it is optical optical or terahertz optical uh, scheme. So let's call it multicolor family of pump probe experiment. Here is an example of one of the laboratory in the laser lab consortium that we use in Bordeaux. So what you see here is a high harmonic beam line that is on about six uh, optical table, and this is only the high harmonic beam line. The laser is actually on, on another room. And we use this facility because we wanted to provide to the at a second source um, a different degree of freedom, which is tuning the at second pulse uh, wavelength. So we use our uh, expertise in synthesizing laser field, and we produced a temporal flat top. And then we uh, show that it is possible to tune the high harmonic central frequency and therefore the at a second pulse uh, central uh, frequency. And uh, this is perfectly compatible with at a second pulses, and we also can achieve some kind of uh, shaping of the at a second pulse. We also use the uh, laboratory consortium for an experiment with the force uh, infrastructure. So you have here the two beam line that they have uh, provided for the uh, consortium. This is led by Paris Salas and Dimitris Karalambidis. 
And you can see that the more we uh, advance in this presentation, the bigger gets the high beam line. So here is a 20 uh, gigawatt XUV beam of about 15 meter length. And this one is um, about 100 megawatt XUV beam that is about 30 meter length or more. So with those infrastructure, we wanted to continue our investigation on how to measure at a second pulses. And we've been looking into um, measuring basically um, at the second to femtosecond pulses by playing with the trajectory I mentioned before. And uh, we made the demonstration of at a second, and now we, do the, we did the demonstration of um, measuring a uh, 1.4 femtosecond XUV pulse um, using the XUV autocorrelation technique. Finally, from uh, the lab and the laser uh, lab, Laser Europe Consortium, we have investigated a lot, some time onto, uh, um, onto building uh, or helping building infrastructure. So there is a big infrastructure in Europe which is called ELI, Extreme Light Infrastructure. There's one in Hungary, which is the Alps one, and there's one in uh, Czech Republic in Prague, which is the ELI beam lines. Um, so I've been dedicating two years on building a line with the team over there and training the team uh, onto this, uh, this type of, uh, of beam lines. So this is the, the beam line, which is long of about 15 meter. But what is interesting here is that, as I mentioned before, we have two trends, high repetition rate or really powerful lasers. And here what they try to do is actually to combine both. So they have a niturbium system, which is 100 kilohertz, but then producing um, uh, about 40 millijoule um, uh, uh, laser pulses uh, in the range of um, 20 femtosecond and potentially going to few cycle pulses with 6 femtosecond. And what we demonstrated here is the very first um, at the second pulse characterization on this beam line. And, uh, and this is very important because the ELI uh, uh, infrastructure is supposed to provide those beam lines for users. So this was a proof that this was at second uh, uh, beam line, at high repetition rate. Uh, finally, um, we also looked into other aspects of the at the second sources at high repetition rate, which is basically that um, we all know the efficiency can be an issue with high harmonic generation, but also there is another challenge that is the special property of those at a second uh, pulses because the high harmonic generation have different wavefront. Therefore, when you want to focus those at a second pulses onto a target, you are not really focusing microjoule at a second pulses because it spreads due to the multifocus situation. So this is a new project that we have with the Eli Beam Lines at King's, um, and this is uh, funded by Royal Society and also the uh, Czech Republic uh, funding, and we are working on uh, optimizing the wavefront of the high harmonic by different uh, techniques. Here, this is the room of the lasers. You can see this is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, this is an OBCPA uh, system with seven uh, stages. And uh, here you have basically the high harmonic lines. So you've got the soft X-ray capability, the hard X-ray capability, and here we have a little bit of dynastic on ultra-fast optical spectroscopy. And I work on that with my colleague André Schroth, who is the head of at the second or HD beam line over there. With this beam line, we are looking into this optimization of wavefront. There is actually uh, an experiment going on right now that we are piloting remotely from here. So this is quite interesting and it works uh, for the moment, it works uh, quite well. Finally, I wanted to give you a roadmap of how those other second sources um, stand in the, in the possibility of sources uh, of photons. So we are working really hard on getting at the second sources as optimized as possible with as much energy into the pulses. Uh, the goal is really microjoule uh, level. Uh, we are pushing into the different degree of freedom, tunability, polarization control, waveform control, all that kind of things. And we are also developing a lot of diagnostics related to that. Of course, uh, the next generation of ultra-fast laser is also something we are pushing, and we are also talking into uh, working into XUV technology. At King's, we do many applications in colors and phase, so solid high amenity generation, metamaterials as well. Uh, to look at hot carrier uh, dynamics. We are looking also into controlling dynamics and we try to bridge the gap with interdisciplinary aspect with the collaboration with chemists and biologists. 
And finally, there is a quite interesting uh, question, I think, with those uh, uh, as a second sources that are getting bigger and bigger, with more and more degree of freedom of control, which is basically the compatibility with big, uh, big instruments. And so there is a, a nice reflection happening at the moment um, on how this kind of development can seed or benefit to the XFL community, the free electron laser community, how we can scale up using probably different type of laser technologies such as OPCPA, and why not considering really petawatt laser system for that. This is this is also something that can can be blue sky, but that, that needs to be approached and discussed, and this is what is happening in the community at the moment. We are having this big uh, compatibility, so to say, discussion, which I found extremely interesting. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to thank all my collaborators here uh, who uh, contributed to the presentation I did today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amal. So, we said we would do questions now. So are there any questions? Please either raise a hand or put something in the chat. But, but perhaps I can start with one, Amel, about, about the applications to condensed matter. So you, you mentioned MOT insulators and you also mentioned topological systems. Um, I'm just thinking about what would make use of the very short timescales that you have. I mean, naively, I'd assume that you had to have a, some sort of core transition in order to access such such fast timescales. So what's the idea? Is it that you always use the core transition as a kind of marker or clock of what's going on in the condensed matter system? Is that, is that how these experiments work? So there is different type of experiments you can do in condensed phase matter. Mm -hmm. So the one that we are interested at King's are related to uh, basically some kind of uh, transient absorption measurement, for example. There are also uh, some experiments that are based uh, on removing a core electron in materials and see how the OG decay would happen, for example. And for metamaterial, what's really interesting for us is to uh, really capture the uh, hot carrier dynamic for different type of uh, resonances. So it could be, for example, in nano roots. Uh, we'll be looking into resonances, longitudinal or transverse resonances, and trying to excite those resonances and get the information on how fast are those hot electrons and how, how we can control them to create as much as we can, because at the moment the trend is really to increase this hot carrier's uh, production for a sensing measurement. So this is a type of idea. But we, uh, we approach it on the photonics point of view, on the advanced photonics point of view. Okay, well, this is great. Thanks to Amel's talk being spot on, spot on schedule. I think we can we can we can move on to the next presentation, which is John Morangos's video presentation. So, uh, John, over to your over to your video, and then we'll come to questions after that. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk about measuring photo excited dynamics in the few femtosecond time domain using time resolved X ray spectroscopy, and in particular using HHE based at a second X-ray sources um, and uh, looking at an application to studying the photophysics in organic semiconductors with that uh, technique. So the advantage of time resolved spectroscopy in the soft X-ray re regime is it gives us access to both structural and electronic dynamics through the sensitivity of the X-ray spectrum at the absorption edges to both the um, geometric structure and the electronic structure in a sample is illustrated by these uh, carbon containing compounds where by uh, looking in different spectral regions around the carbon K edge, one can identify different features of the electronic structure. So below the edge valence whole states, uh, above uh, 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 in the pre-edge region, the excited uh, bound states, and then uh, going up to the above threshold states, uh, giving us some information about the electron uh, interactions in the near continuum. And for us, the um, edges we're interested in, because these are the ones we can reach with high harmonic generation, are the uh, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen K edges, and the chlorine, sulfur, and phosphorus L edges, uh, as examples. They're important in chemistry, even in, in, in biochemistry. And there's been a lot of progress in recent years on this topic, uh, looking at HHG uh, sources uh, for uh, uh, application to attosecond domain gas phase measurements in, in atomic systems and more recently in small molecular systems. Uh, and, and, and I think really a lot of progress has been made. But our interest in my lab is more in the condensed phase. Um, as well as in gas phase problems. Uh, but here I'm going to talk exclusively about condensed phase problems 
where we uh, have constructed a beamline for doing uh, at a second transient absorption spectroscopy in the soft X-ray range um, based upon uh, high harmonic generation. And uh, the beamline is, is, is photographed here. Uh, I'll say a few words about the, the details in, in a moment. There are two ways that we can generate the high time resolved coherent X-ray sources needed for this kind of probing. One is with high harmonic generation, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And the other is, is with X-ray free electron lasers. And, 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 and some of our work is, is, is using just that technique. I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Although tomorrow I'm giving a seminar in the, uh, in, in, in the Imperial College uh, uh, network for um, frontiers of ultrafast measurement, uh, where I'm going to concentrate on measuring uh, coherent electron dynamics using XFEL sources. Okay, so what we do is we uh, have to generate our, our uh, laser pulse in order that it can generate soft X-ray harmonics. And to do that, we use a, a OPA frequency conversion uh, system to, to take us from the Thai Sapphire uh, base wavelength at 800 nanometers um, to a longer wavelength, in our case, around 1800 nanometers, the idler of an OPA. And that we then compress in time using a standard self-phase modulation frequency compression technique in, in fibers. And we compress the pulse, uh, we control the phase to compress the pulse down to durations as short as about, uh, 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 as around seven or eight femtoseconds. So this corresponds to a one and a half optical cycles at this wavelength. So it really is a very short pulse. Um, I'm not gonna go into the technical details of that much of this is, is published elsewhere. And if you're interested, you can pursue those references. What's interesting for us is that with that few cycle mid infrared uh, or near short, short wavelength infrared um, pulse, we're able to reach into the soft X-ray range. And that's because the scaling physics of high harmonic generation, which essentially scales the cutoff scales as the ponderomotive energy of the electron or three times the ponderomotive energy of the electron, that goes as the square of the light wavelength. And therefore using longer wavelength mid infrared sources allows us to get into this uh, uh, soft X-ray region. So here's an example of, of what we record. Um, and what I'm showing you here is a spectrum, but a spectrum recorded for different carrier envelope phases, for different waveforms of, 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 of the drive pulse. And the fact that the uh, harmonic cutoff is, is, is shifting as we, as we change the CE phase is indicative of the fact that near the cutoff in the 100 EV or so below the cutoff, which in this case goes up to 600 EV, uh, we're generating an isolated sub femtosecond pulse, an attosecond pulse. Uh, we're not using that explicitly in the work I'm gonna describe, but it's a very important characteristic to have and one that we are using in other parts of our research. So basically, by playing around with the uh, generating conditions, we can move that isolated at a second pulse all the way from around 150 EV up to about 600 EV and thereby cover uh, the um, oxygen, uh, carbon and uh, nitrogen K edges. And, and this work is published uh, from a paper a couple of years ago in Science Advances, which you may want to, to take a look at. And, and one of the, the, the key features is we do this with a reasonable efficiency, uh, a flux large enough to make um, static Zanes measurements even at the oxygen K edge. So this was the first ever HHG based static Zanes measurement at the oxygen K edge. Uh, showing that there are enough photons to get a relatively noisy Zane spectrum there. But we go down to the nitrogen K edge at 410 EV and we get really good quality data. So that's good enough. You have enough flux there to start contemplating doing a pump probe measurement with a changing time delay and actually mapping out dynamics. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Doing that, um, looking at an organic semiconductor, P3HT, polytheophene, um, we did a couple of years ago some static Zanes measurements on that at the sulfur L edge and the carbon K edge, very high quality Zanes measurements uh, using this HHG source. And now what we've done is to do time resolved measurements where we, whereby we pump um, the exciton in, in this material, which is around 600 nanometers. And then we study the change around the carbon K edge that happens immediately after we've, we've pumped with, with a pump pulse. 
So to do that, we have the, the following setup. So this is our the insides of our beam line. We have, um, uh, 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 basically we split the beam. Most of the energy goes to generate the high harmonics um, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a gas target. Uh, uh, the, the, the rest of about 20% of the energy then goes to be third harmonic, to, to goes to, for third harmonic generation to generate a pulse at 600 nanometers. And we've measured the duration of that pulse using a, a second harmonic frog to be about 16 femtoseconds. So it's not, not as short as our probe pulse. Our probe pulse, as we say, is probably less than a femtosecond. But uh, nevertheless, this is giving us access to the, to the first 20 femtoseconds or so of, of time resolution required for these kinds of measurements. The pump and the probe pulse are then combined at a toroidal mirror and focused into the uh, P3HT target. And then we analyze the transmitted X-ray spectrum using an X-ray spectrometer. Um, and so basically the strategy is we, we pump the exciton at around 600 nanometers, and then we, we look with the probe at how the carbon KH absorption changes. Now, similar measurements have recently been done on a uh, using the flash uh, free electron laser, um, where um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy was used, uh, looking at a, a, another organic light harvesting system, and uh, that that works very nice. It was recently published in in, in Nature Communications, uh, but they yield a much lower temporal resolution than, than than we've been able to achieve using our HHG setup. So basically, here's the, the main data from that measurement. As you can see, um, we are looking at the differential absorption as a function of delay. So we, we changed the, the delay between the, uh, the pump pulse and the probe pulse from, from about minus 30 femtoseconds through to about plus 100 femtoseconds. So uh, essentially, we have um, nothing uh, happening uh, uh, until zero femtoseconds when the pump comes in. And after that, we have a lot of action immediately happening in the sample. So there are two important features that we note. First of all, a very strong edge shift feature associated with the formation of the exciton. And secondly, a, a transient feature, um, which is sort of associated with the formation of the whole state associated with the exciton. Obviously, when you excite the exciton, there's a, there's a whole state left behind and we're, we're kind of probing that. But the, the, the actual dynamics of this um, requires some, some theoretical interpretation, which we'll come to in a moment. But essentially, you can see that this transient feature uh, develops within about 10 femtoseconds and dies away in about 30 or 40 femtoseconds, whereas the edge shift feature is much more persistent. Probably it will, it will die away over a longer time scale. Of the way we made the measurements didn't allow us to do really long time delay runs. But nevertheless, over this very short time scale, we capture something that looks like a static change. And so basically those two features, which I'm calling um, A and B, the transient feature is A and the other feature is B, they show a time dependence in the B feature, the shift feature, which is basically, it, it, it turns on over about 10 femtoseconds and then it stays shifted on the time scales that we've measured over. Whereas the A feature shows a very rapid switch on, probably much faster than a few fem uh, the, 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 than 10 femtoseconds, followed by uh, uh, something like a, a, a 15 femtosecond decay time. So to interpret that, we've 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 used uh, um, our, our, our relationships with Tom Penfold at, at the University of Newcastle and Artem Bakulin in Imperial Chemistry. Um, Tom is an expert at uh, the time-dependent DFT um, modeling of such systems, and so he has taken a look at how to model this. And the way he's modeled it is as um, an oligothiophene um, system and, and, and a singlet exciton. And actually that captures very well the A feature, this edge shift feature. So basically his results reproduce that, the red curve, really strongly and quantitatively as well. And so basically what happens is as soon as you make the exciton, you have a mo movement of electron density away from the carbon to the sulfur atom, which is, which is uh, illustrated in this rendering from the calculation of how you're moving uh, from the carbon, electrons from the carbon atom to the, to, to, to the, uh, to the, to the, to the sulfur atoms. But that doesn't explain the transient feature. And so to explain the transient feature, we've had to go further. We've tried a number of different uh, ways to understand it. And the one that works and gives us a clue as to what's going on is to actually um, use a pair 
of, of tetratheophene oligomers around one and a half nanometers apart. And that sort of captures this dynamical feature. So essentially what seems to be happening is um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the exciton initially delocalizes, that increases the absorption because it delocalizes onto neighboring sites and that, that actually changes a little bit the cross-section for absorption. And then that decays away um, as, 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 as the feature either further delocalizes or fully localizes. Um, so basically, that's all I was going to tell you about, just to illustrate one of the applications of these uh, high uh, time resolution uh, soft X-ray uh, transient absorption capabilities. So HAG sources can be used for high quality time resolved X-ray spectroscopy, uh, applicable to condensed phase materials, and um, may be very crucial to understanding early evolution of exciton dynamics in molecules and polymers. Now, I have glossed over a number of issues about this measurement, one of which is what the pump pulse does in terms of thermal loading to the target and changing things through heating. Um, I'm happy to talk about that in more detail um, in questions if that's available, but, but nevertheless, we've, we've actually characterized that heating and we understand that we're well below the threshold for melting the system, so we are um, in a controlled regime, but you do have to be very careful when you're doing these pump probe measurements to understand what your pump pulse is doing and also to understand any accumulated damage due to repeated probing. XFELs, of course, could also do this, and XFELs also offer um, X-ray pump, X-ray probe capabilities with few femtosecond temporal resolution, and that's one of my other areas of research. I think in, for these materials, they offer complementary routes, photoelectron spectroscopy being a very nice one, whereas the HHG sources, because they're essentially a super continuum source, it's quite natural to do uh, X-ray transient absorption measurements. So my argument is that time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy offers a powerful new probe of time and space development of electronic excitation in materials. And so I thank you for, for your attention. And I think with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much indeed. I thought you were about to get me twice there, but yeah, was really <laughs> I was really worried. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all, about, it's all about harmonics and repeated collisions, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Are there any questions for John? I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Oh, it's, okay. it is waving a hand. That's the old fashioned way. Go That's ahead. a real physical hand and a real physical voice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm always really impressed to, to see these setups and the fantastic uh, bean lines that, that you put together um, and the, you know, the dedication of the students that uh, keep everything uh, running. Um, I haven't visited your lab, but I did visit Simon Wall's lab in, in Barcelona, and he was also with this holy grail of trying to get to the oxygen k edge but mm. the thing that shocked me was the, that they they have a, a a whole room full of helium bottles and they're using a, a, the high harmonic generation in a helium nozzle they have to pump it really hard and they can only run for like 30 minutes at a time or something i'm wondering is is this the same with your setup do you yes and indeed it's the same guy video? doing it because that was where alan alan johnson ended up after his phd and with me it. and uh, he's been having a very happy time in barcelona um yeah in fact we get even more expensive because we can be sometimes using neon at that very high rate and that is really painful, but you know, it's one of the ways to do it. I would say to get to the oxygen K edge, however, I would be less keen to do it with HHG these days. Um, we were very successful in our collaboration with LCLS like a year or so ago in being able to demonstrate at a second pulses from XFELs at the oxygen K edge with something like a billion times uh, more photons than we generate in the pulses in our lab. So I would say for the oxygen K edge, I'd, you know, I would plump more for a free electron laser if I could get time at one and, and do it that way around. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, John. Any other questions? Can I ask my condensed matter question again? That that time scale, that 30 to 40 femtosecond time scale that you said come from comes from the pair. I didn't, I didn't quite get wh where you thought wh which which physics you thought that was measuring. Is it is it, it like it, some sort? It's about delo. We think it's about delocalization of the exciton. So basically, in the first sort of ten to twenty femtoseconds, the exciton delocalizes from the initial uh, location to the second of the of the units. 
which is around one and a half nanometers away. And, and that actually increases the cross-section for the absorption. So the, the, the it's a rather subtle effect as to whether it increases or decreases it, but actually it turns out it increases it when you, when you, when you plug in the, the TDFT uh, dipole moments. Uh, or you calculate the dipole moments from that. And so that's essentially it. I mean, what happens after that? I would say we're still a little uncertain because as you may notice, there is a hint of a second sort of revival. So it, it comes down, but it may actually start coming up again. So it's possible even we got some sort of coherent dynamics, but yeah, I've been a bit like reluctant that. to claim on that up to now. Yeah. And I think we would like to date more data in that direction before we're more confident on that point. Thanks. Well, we've got time for one more question from Sandrine. Sandrine. Hi. Yeah. Th thanks very much for for a wonderful well, for for both wonderful talks. Um, I have a question on uh, so on, on these uh, P3HT and sort of molecule orientation. Uh, it, basically, do you have any um, information about orientation dependence on orientation of the, no. uh, of the molecules? We, we really haven't looked at this as a as a function of sample morphology yet. So we've made a pretty standard prescription of uh, spin coated P3HT films. Um, we, 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 we know, uh, you know, that they are, they are, they are pretty standard, they're, they're, but whether or not, if it was regio regular or otherwise, it would look different, we don't know. And that's one of the things we want to now start looking at, because if, if that transient feature is about, um, delocalization and transfer to neighbors, then it should depend upon the local morphology. Um, so well, that's one of the, the the next steps in the work. Another next step is to actually put some sort of acceptor site inside and actually look at the you know the the actual charge delocalization and separation, which I think would be really quite exciting. So I think all those things are going to be possible using this sort of methodology. Um, but you know we had to start somewhere, so we started with just a, a bog standard spin coated P3HT uh, film. Okay, but there is the next. It's considered for the next step. Oh, absolutely, and we're very keen to talk with people about what to do next. So of course, we're talking with Artem, who's who's, who's uh, one of our local experts in this. But we're we're very happy to talk with other people. If you've got ideas about materials that maybe you think could be exciting in this regard, where we can learn something new, then just just follow it up, and we can we can talk about how to maybe try and implement that. Okay, definitely. Thank you so much. Bye. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I think we better move on to our third talking view of the time. So this is Ian Robinson from UCL, who's going to talk about uh, laser melting of polycrystalline metals, and he's going to live dangerously and do it live. Go for it, Ian. Okay. So uh, uh, thank you, Andrew and uh, Megan, for the um, arranging the seminar. I've, I've enjoyed the previous ones in this series uh, a lot because I get to find out what my what my colleagues in LCN are doing. Um, and hopefully uh, this will help to uh, contribute to that uh, that exercise. So um, I'll put my acknowledgements at the at the at the beginning here. Um, this is the work of one one uh, UCL student uh, and a big group of people from Brookhaven, which is my my second home uh, here. Um, and what we're trying to do is to learn how to do high energy diffraction experiments that Simon Billing is, a, is an expert on, and we've got uh, se several group members uh, uh, interested in, in, in doing that. And I'm talking about free electron laser experiments, but I won't, I won't say anything about free electron lasers. I kind of thought John might say something, but, uh, and he did, uh, but uh, uh, anyway. Uh, but our host was the uh, pal Exfel facility, and Daewoong Nam was, uh, built the, uh, the scanning stage that was essential to the experiments. And we have Korean collaborators, Hyun Jung Kim and Chang Yong Song uh, from uh, two different universities uh, in, in Korea that uh, make the experiments possible. So the question we're, we're trying to uh, ask is in, in metals, simple polycrystalline metals, uh, what, what's going on when you excite it with a laser to the point of, of melting it? And so the sort of things we wanted to check with uh, X-ray diffraction experiments were whether we could see the liquid phase and if we could see the liquid, uh, whether the liquid is different at, uh, at early time, uh, possibly due to its, uh, its originating as a, as a solid. Uh, we wanted to look, as others have, at how fast the melting takes place. But the thing I'm going to tell you about today is where does the melting start? And that, that turned out to be a bit of a revelation and led to uh, a fairly important paper and, and some new results that I'll show you as well. And the key to all of this, uh, theoretically, is this uh, so-called two-temperature model that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. And then one of the, in fact, Sandrine's uh, question was uh, about the, the sample geometry. That's still to be answered with our work as well. 
Okay, so the experiment is is a pretty simple powder diffraction experiment. You have your XFL beam line, which in Korea is a, a kilometer long uh, linear accelerator followed by an undulator producing a, an X-ray beam. Um, in our recent experiment, we were able to use self-seeded beam for the first time, and I'll show you at the end uh, the very much improved results we got to using the self-seeding. Um, and we do a pump probe experiment, just as uh, Emil uh, described, uh, uh, where we excite with the laser first, we adjust the timing of the laser and the fluence of the laser and look at the effect that it has on the, on the sample. And the key to the Korean setup is that we've got the scanner system because we destroy the sample in, in, every, in every shot. And so to do a, a time delay series, we need to line up a set of, of samples in a row and we scan a 23 by 23 array of, of samples here. And uh, what we're looking at are the powder diffraction rings that come out. And you can see some examples in the inset uh, here. But uh, better to look at a, a movie. And this shows uh, a little bit the, the way that the signal is fluctuating a lot. This was the experiment we did three years ago on, on gold uh, films, uh, quite thick films. Um, and we carefully adjusted the fluence. But what you can see is that as a function of time delay, the clock's not actually shown, but this is over the picosecond time range. So again, an order of magnitude slower than, than what uh, John was talking about. Um, we see that the appearance of this additional uh, strong feature on the inside of the, of the diffraction peak. And so this is just looking at the first 111 diffraction peak, which, which goes down generally uh, as, as you... Uh, uh, as you uh, change the time delay, but the, the 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 new peak appears on the on the inside, and it's almost at the point where this would be the position of the peak if the if the gold was at the melting point due to thermal expansion. So we can sort of label the the peak on the left as being the hot peak, and the peak on the right as being the cold peak during this uh, during this transition. But already you can see just in the raw data that there's a considerable heterogeneity going on. There are, there's, there's a hot phase and a cold phase simultaneously present in the sample that's induced by the laser. And that's what we'll talk about today. So this is uh, theory work done by um, uh, Alex Luger and Dorothy Duffy at, uh, in, in the LCN uh, a few years ago, where they were trying to look at uh, electron diffraction uh, measurements of, of similar things. Uh, but what they could see, they're, they're doing a, a simple uh, energy calculation using an embedded atom method, but they've got uh, two temperature references. They've got an electron temperature and a lattice temperature, and they're looking at the electron phonon coupling or electron lattice coupling between those two populations. Um, and, and that's, you know, part of the, the model that they're using. Um, and so what, what they were interested in looking at was the appearance of these red features, which are low coordinated sites in the lattice, which are the beginning of melting. And so uh, we, I think we use the same language. Uh, when we talk about melting, we're talking about local disorder of the uh, immediate configuration of the, uh, of the gold atoms in the lattice. But you can also see, and this is where I want to highlight, you can see that there's a surface effect going on. And this um, wasn't the main goal of their study, but you can see that the surface region is getting thicker as a function of time delay. And what this corresponds to is, is a melt front which is coming from the surface. And so we can sort of ask the question, how, how does this, this early time uh, behavior come about? And um, what it's telling us is that this process of coupling between the, the lattice and the, uh, and the electrons, of course, the laser uh, on a very short time scale generates electrons, the electrons travel very quickly through the sample, and we're assuming that the electrons equilibrate within the first picosecond. And everything we're looking at in the multi-picosecond time scale is the coupling of the electrons to, uh, to the lattice that leads to melting. Um, and, and so basically this is showing that the, the, uh, the coupling is taking place preferentially at the surface. And this is a fairly old idea that melting uh, can start at, at surfaces, but this is in the, in the time domain. Okay, so we're looking at a polycrystalline sample, and so the idea uh, of, of the, the explanation that we have for the heterogeneous behavior is that the melting starts where the electrons scatter at the grain boundaries in the crystal, and then propagates outwards into the, uh, in, into the grains of the crystal. And what we're measuring is a powder average of all of this, and so we're seeing, the, uh, we're seeing actually three phases altogether. We're seeing a liquid phase, 
which is already melted. We're seeing a melt front phase, which is this uh, orange one here, and the unmelted material that's got electrons in it, but doesn't yet have the coupling to, to, to start the melting. And we can model it just simply by the heat diffusion equation. If we inject a heat pulse at, uh, uh, at, at a, a single position and just watch it evolve, then uh, you can do, put in the real numbers for gold 20 picoseconds later, you would have a distribution like this. Uh, the melting point of gold is 1,000 degrees, and so you have uh, all those three phases. You have a liquid, you have a melting phase. I'll come back to that in a second. And then a solid phase that hasn't yet melted. And the melt front is traveling, diffusing basically uh, from the, uh, by, by thermal conduction from the, uh, from the grain boundary. And the, the size scale is compatible with the, the size of the sample we're looking at. So hundreds of nanometers for the, uh, for, for the size of the front. So what's interesting here is that this you have to put in the latent heat, and the latent heat puts in a, an offset here. And this uh, orange region in the middle is the part that's actually undergoing the melting, and we're calling that the melt region. And that's the origin of this uh, this new uh, this new feature that we're seeing. And if you go through the thermal calculation, you can actually calculate the melt front velocity, um, and it's different for this melt front and this one because of the latent heat. And so this region in orange should be getting, just by the thermal calculation, should be getting broader in, uh, in, in time uh, as, the, uh, as the melt front is traveling into the, into the crystal grain. And this is the analysis of the data that we, we did on that uh, experiment uh, on gold. And we can see that there's a, about a 70 picosecond uh, rise before the melt front gets set up, but we get this extra peak coming in. And in a way that more or less doesn't depend on fluence, it gets the peak gets narrower as a function of time and the velocity that comes out if you look at the slope of that line is actually the same as Dorothy got in her in her calculation so it's a slow melt front that that, that takes plenty of time to get into the grains of the of, of the crystal and the fluence dependence is also interesting uh, it peaks at the amount of heat needed for one pulse to just put enough energy into the film to melt it and if you go too low, you don't get enough melt front. If you go too high, you start getting other things we haven't looked into, but probably ablation and, uh, um, and uh, uh, vaporization and so forth. OK, um, so this is our second try at the, uh, at the experiment. And we did this one by remote control a month ago. Um, uh, chose the setup with uh, this time uh, palladium uh, thin film samples that we wanted to look at with the big detector uh, parked uh, a few centimeters behind the sample and the scanner to move the, the sample uh, through through the beam. And um, this shows that we, with the, the self-seeded beam, we got a lot more intensity and we we're able to, to really see the formation of, of distinct peaks in the in the uh, uh, in the region just just beneath this uh, first powdering. And so far, we've only analyzed the same thing that we looked at with the gold, which is this, this first 111 powdering. But you can already see we've got a lot of work still to do. Uh, there's a, in palladium, we get a lot of strain generated, and we get a, a very broad uh, uh, 311 uh, outer drag peak that we haven't even looked at yet. But we're going, to, we're going to move to that. But just to give you a progress report here, uh, we've, we've been able to reproduce this, uh, this uh, narrowing of the peak uh, with uh, with time delay at a similar kind of fluence level in palladium uh, to uh, to what we saw with gold, and so we're uh, we're, we're we're basically reproducing the, uh, the the gold experiment, and we've got a lot more additional data that we can look at in the future. Um, so that's where I'm going to stop. Um, just a, a sort of taste of of what we're doing. We're looking at laser induced disorder generally called melting, but uh, but that is one of the questions, is whether this short time behavior really is genuine melting or whether it's some kind of uh, sort of solid uh, amorphous state that's generated on the short time scale. We're identifying three phases. I didn't show you, but uh, we do have data that show we can see the liquid using the, the PDF methods that uh, Simon Billinge is uh, is expert in. Uh, we're seeing the solid unmelted material and also this melt front uh, phase. And this explains the, the inhomogeneous melting uh, rather nicely. And the energy transfer is therefore concluded to take place at the grain boundaries in a polycrystalline material. And this is just like the uh, surface melting that you get on, on, on nanoparticles that's been studied by 
uh, by, uh, by other people. And because we're doing a diffraction experiment, we're actually able to get structure of the, uh, of the melt front. So hopefully that was less than 15 minutes. Your time was impeccable, Ian. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, questions. I, I've got one thing I'd love to ask you, which is this is I rather perhaps ask you for the moon here, but for for static powder diffraction, as I understand it, I'm not an expert, but there's a there's a whole zoo of methods now which enable you to infer information about the about the structure, even if it, in a highly disordered material from the static powder pattern. I'm thinking of methods like reverse Monte Carlo and so on. Is there is there any chance of being able to do something like that with your dynamics to learn about the structure more about the structure of this melt phase rather than just the position of the first peak? Yeah, well, I've got the advantage of being live, so I can just flick forward to my ah. back slide, which is this is the extraction of the diffuse peak from that powder pattern. And if we go forward, there's your simulation. So so we can extract what's called the pair distribution function from the, the from that green curve that we extracted. And this is all preliminary uh, results, but uh, but looks quite credible. And we can simulate it using using sort of it, it, we don't. Uh, Simon actually doesn't like the reverse Monte Carlo uh, method, but uh, but we can uh, but we can at least simulate it and do a side by side comparison, and he's he's comfortable with that. So uh, yes, we're, we're we're doing it. Okay, I promise you, Ian did not pay me to ask that question. Uh, any 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 other any other ones? Keep my eye for any hands up or anything in the anything in the chat. Oh, Sandrine, go for it. Yeah, th thanks very much, Ian. Um, that, that, that's fascinating. I was I was wondering. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know very much about about this this technique, and but I wonder how it would correlate, for example, with electron microscopy experiments. If if EM could give some kind of complementary information at grain boundaries as well, um, through through heating, maybe local heating with the with the electron beam and and diffraction at the same time, or um, yeah, the thing that would be hard would be to destroy the sample and then look uh, uh, look at the destroyed state of the of the grain boundary, and so that's why the average of powder diffraction is uh, is actually preferable uh, to 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 look at that, even though you don't get that local sort of information. Um, there is something halfway in between, which is ultrafast electron diffraction, and that actually is extremely suitable for this problem. Um, and it's a little bit uh, cheaper than an XFL uh, to build. You use a, an MEV um, accelerator and uh, a 20-meter-long beamline instead of a kilometer-long uh, beamline uh, uh, to do it. And they have one at Stanford, and we're we're trying to uh, get access to it. It's actually just as hard to get access as the as the uh, as the XFL, but uh, but uh, it, it's also something that that could be built in a university, for example. But ultrafast electron diffraction would be would be very good for that. But you'd still be looking at averages over the whole sample, and and, and I've, I've tried to show that, that that is actually still quite useful. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Sandrine. I think uh, it's fourteen fifty eight, and uh, I know there are other things coming up. So to, oh, John, John, John has a question. What? What? Quick question. Uh, it's John. not a question. It's actually just a plug. Um, Go for it. Ian, Amel, and myself have all been working on this uh, XFEL case for a next generation XFEL. And uh, part of our next step is to do a conceptual design study and, and other such things. And to convince to convince the funders to, to fund us, we do need to, 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 to have support from the community. And so we've organized a survey, which I think LCN has distributed to you. Um, it's in two parts. One part is just to register who's been active in XFELs and who's planning to be active in XFELs. And the other part is to endorse the need for a next generation XFL. So it's it's a plug. I'm, I'm, I apologize for taking the opportunity shamelessly to make it. We're very happy for you to do that. Very happy for you to do that, John. It's just that's great. Do you, do you want to put the link in the chat? I think we I think we've circulated. Do you have it? Do you have it to hand? You have circulated it. What I could, I, I don't have the link easily no to hand. So uh, I think it has been circulated. Alan. Yeah, I think so just an urge anyone who's seen it and hasn't done anything about it yet, maybe to just go and have a go at it. Yeah, Andrew, Andrew put in a, a good a good uh, cover note to to support it, uh, so it did go to the whole of LCN. Yeah, that's much appreciated. 
All right. Well, it's three o'clock, so I guess we should say thank you very much. For that three really fantastic talks. Thank you very much. And a, a, a very exciting junction of different scientific areas coming here. So keep, let's all keep our eyes on this. And uh, good luck with your Exile case, John and John and collaborators.